pick up the Samsung Galaxy S8 Plus and roll it around in your hands. It's super sleek, super solid. It's like finding an alien object fallen from space and polished smooth by centuries of space dust abrasion. That the time and date, or optionally a calendar or photo, are glowing gently from underneath the hard jet black Gorilla Glass 5 is something of a tech wonder. Everything is kept minimal and subservient to this smooth design. Is this really from the same company that made the plastic fantastic ridged Galaxy S5 only three years ago? There are downsides to the full-on glass surfaces, of course. There's the inevitable need to keep the Galaxy S8 Plus in a protective TPU or leather case in case it drops, meaning you'll only really ever get to feel these emotions on day one, as thereafter it'll be housed inside something very definitely man-made and less spacey. You only need to protect against drops and shocks though since Samsung has impressively managed to make the S8 range IP68 compliant, so completely water and dustproof. Samsung calls the 6.2 inch 18.5 by 9 WQHD plus AMOLED screen an infinity display and it's easy to see where the moniker comes from. It's larger and more colorful and higher contrast and more immersive than any phone display I've ever seen. Virtual controls at the display's bottom and the Android status bar at the top frame your content in traditional fashion. Though when an application, for example, watching media, takes control of the whole screen, it's like that moment in a cinema when the side panels pull away and everything suddenly gets bigger and wider. Well, that's the theory anyway. Most streaming media is still at 16 by 9 and will be for some time, so you've often got black bars either side of such content. Though Samsung has thought of this and compensated though by making the fascias of each S8 or S8 Plus, whatever its colour, black, so that the sidebars meld seamlessly into the phone's frame. Then if you're happy to forgo a little content vertically and don't mind your content being stretched slightly, there's a crop to fit button that gives this. <laughs> Both techniques are used to fill the screen intelligently. Having mentioned virtual controls, these are an obvious departure for Samsung, which has previously clung rigidly to an iPhone copying physical home button, usually accompanied by a trademark, capacitive menu, recent apps and back controls. The button had to go, of course, given the display aspirations here, though the change has meant that you can now have the controls whichever way around you want, i.e. back can now be on the left, as on most other Android phones, if you want it this way. Although there's no physical home button, Samsung detects hard presses on the bottom centre of the display by small distortions in the glass. And this kicks in what the old button used to do, i.e. the notifications and lock screen. It's accompanied by a haptic pulse from the phone's vibrator. This is delayed very slightly from the actual press, and this sadly ruins the illusion of a well physical press. The back of the S8 Plus is curved in the same way, i.e. symmetrically, though I did note that the rear glass doesn't have an oleophobic coating applied, making it not as slippery, but with the downside it gathers fingerprints like they're going out of fashion. The main camera is now perfectly flush and just a small metallic ring raised up to protect it from scratches. The thinner camera module thankfully doesn't seem to have affected results so much as we'll see. The design decision that has caused the most controversy is the positioning of the fingerprint sensor here, off to one side of the camera lens. This means that even after much practice, you'll end up putting greasy fingerprints on at least some of the camera glass every time you try and unlock the phone this way. It's a long way to stretch the index finger for a right-handed user, especially on this larger S8+. Plus. The backstory famously is that Samsung wanted to put the sensor under the main display but couldn't get the tech working in time, so had to fall back on plan B in order to ship the S8 and S8 Plus on time. This is eminently plausible and I can imagine the frustration in Samsung's design team as they had to make that fateful compromise. The camera glass smudging is so worrisome that I found myself contorting my finger slightly so as to avoid the camera glass each time and as a result the fingerprint recognition was impaired. And so we move to an alternative method of unlocking the Galaxy S8 Plus Iris recognition. This was pioneered on the Lumia range by Microsoft a couple of years ago here, unlocking my 950 XL <laughs> in the same way. And it's faster still here on the S8 range, but it's still flawed. A front facing camera and infrared LED light up your irises as you bring the phone up to your face. And if all goes well, everything will be recognized and you'll be authenticated and in. Unfortunately, it falls down if you wear glasses and very focals here 
are the worst, distorting the patterns and unsurprisingly, recognition doesn't work. And so we move on to strike three, face recognition. Now this was tried back in 2013 on the Google Nexus 4, four years ago, and it never really took off, partly because it required a certain range of good light conditions and angles to work, and partly because it wasn't that secure. A photo of your face printed out can unlock the phone better than the real thing under some conditions. So with 2017 security concerns, it's a sign that Samsung was pretty desperate in order to have brought this old chestnut back and it hasn't improved in the intervening years. Then there are the usual pin, pattern and password unlocks. Curiously, more in favour now on the S8 because of the flawed nature of the previous three authentication methods. All of this does take away some of the shiny, shiny wonder of the S8 design as a whole. It's a true Achilles heel, given that there are literally hundreds of far cheaper Android phones now with very decent specs, which have convenient, sensibly placed and reliable fingerprint sensors and in. Under the hood here is a powerful Exynos 8895 chipset with 4 gig of RAM, 64 gig of internal storage, they're only 50 free out of the box, plus micro SD on the pop-out SIM tray if needed. The Qualcomm X16 LTE modem is rated at one gigabit per second, so up to 100 megabytes per second transfer over cellular data. Now that's what I call future proof. Samsung has played relatively safely with the Galaxy S8 Plus with a, only a 3500 mAh battery, even in this tall phone frame. I'm sure they factored in battery expansion and allowed bigger margins of error this time round. Uh, you remember the Note 7 fiasco. Battery life isn't an issue though, with Android 7's own battery optimizations add to by some aggressive sleeping of background apps by Samsung, combined getting through a busy day with the Galaxy S8 Plus is easy. And if you do need a top up, then charging is easy too. A standard USB type C port on the bottom of the phone is quick charge two compatible, though not three, interestingly, at least with current firmware. As an additional safety measure from Samsung, fast charging doesn't work while the screen is powered on, i.e. you're using the phone. Now be honest, we've all tried using a phone while it's being charged in the past and notice how warm the electronics get from the double activity and we feel suitably guilty. So this is just Samsung being better safe than sorry. If a single Galaxy S8 catches fire for any reason, then Samsung really is in trouble. Qi and PMA wireless charging coils are also provided. Should charging pad top-ups during the day be convenient for you? Plenty of options anyway. Also down at the bottom is a solitary speaker of decent volume and fidelity. Here's a demo of it. Mr. Bonamassa, full volume. It's fine, it's absolutely fine, but it's mono. I've already commented on the previous phone show about LG missing a trick on the G6 by pairing a wonderful HDR display with mono sound. And the same applies here. The extra wide Galaxy S8 Plus is crying out for a stereo speaker pair. Even a clutched implementation as on the HTC phone, you know, stereo but split between tweeter and woofer would have helped. But no, all the sound comes out of the bottom right of the device, the grill is easy to block, and there's simply no stereo satisfaction. Again, it's a missed opportunity in a high cost flagship. Even the budget ZT Axon 7 Mini reviewed in Phone Show 303 at a third the cost has insanely great stereo front facing speakers. There's really no excuse for missing this aspect of smartphone based entertainment. One consolation will be that right next to the USB Type-C port and speaker is a 3.5mm audio jack. Now, Apple jumped the gun by getting rid of this on the iPhone 7 range, as did a few other Android manufacturers who copied it, and it's good to see Samsung staying with what works. Being able to listen to music while charging one's phone is actually darned useful and common. Who knew? Samsung bundled some excellent little AKG braided headphones. Uh, these have good bass and general fidelity and are a world apart from the rubbish earphones Samsung used to bundle in the old days. Well done all round. Despite the S8 camera being as flush as the LG G6s, Samsung has done a much better job at compensating for the thin camera unit in software. The 12 megapixel f over 1.7 wide-ish angle lens is backed by a 1 over 2.5 inch dual pixel autofocus sensor and OIS. All very capable, but the biggest impact is in software with Google Pixel-like multi-frame processing. So instead of just taking one photo at a time, a burst of at least three shots is always taken, and then these are averaged and optimized, computing out digital noise and artifacts while also allowing for genuine subject movement. 
Samsung don't quite take this to the same lengths as Google's Pixel, the HDR Plus software, but the presence of the insanely fast focusing dual pixel system and optical OIS makes up the difference. This could well be the best all round phone camera in the world right now. I have seen higher image quality on my Microsoft Lumia 950 XL here, but it's left in the dust in terms of speed, consistency and convenience by the S8 Plus. Video is optically stabilized and optionally electronically stabilized too, up to 4K and with good stereo audio capture and that insanely fast focus again. Look at this. Allied to the great screen, even outdoors from all angles and provided you have the phone in a secure case, you don't drop it. The Galaxy S8 and S8 Plus make for a really compelling casual camcorder. I did omit one button from the hardware rundown earlier. It's here and it's only got one function. It launches Bixby, Samsung's new personal digital assistant. As of now, it's just a placeholder really for some news, weather and PIM reminders alongside a Bixby vision utility that's supposed to recognize things you've got in front of you and find them online for, well, well, buying again. Anyway, it failed pretty miserably in my tests. Now, Samsung's vision is to have just about everything on the phone potentially controlled by voice via Bixby, as in Bixby, send the four latest photos to Jim with subject line last night's party, which is all possibly slower than actually using the touchscreen. But hey, you might be driving or un otherwise unable to use the touchscreen or just, well, lazy. It's an all encompassing voice vision, but it's just that a vision an ambition. And it's very much still born here on the Galaxy S8 and S8 Plus. The decision to hardwire a button on the phone to something which isn't remotely ready can only be described in a yes minister fashion as courageous. <laughs> TouchWiz, widely hated by geeks and loved by regular users, became Grace UX a year ago with Samsung trying to play down the bad name that the former UI had garnered in the tech press. And now it's seemingly just the Samsung experience, which is a very apt name to describe just about everything about the Galaxy S8 and S8 Plus. The bloat and gimmicks from the past are scaled down now with most of the gestures and options packaged in settings and most of the Samsung first party apps only suggested installs when you go through the setup sequence. And it's easy to say no thanks. You still get Samsung Health. Uh, you get the Internet browser useful for its ad blocking, but most people will still use Chrome, I suspect. Email. Well, not everyone uses Gmail and Gallery, but the Samsung application stable isn't forced on every user, thankfully. And if you do fancy grabbing some of those apps anyway, they're here under the Galaxy Apps mini store. In the same fashion as on Google's Pixels, the app drawer here is brought up with a swipe within the home screen UI that you can keep going to, uh, well, toggle the two. And there are the usual Samsung grid sorting and ordering options. All icons are sanitized within a squircle outline, but this didn't really bother me. Somewhat oddly, Samsung has implemented a completely different long press menu for home screen and app drawer icons to Google with its latest Pixel devices. Google's version is more like Apple's with a deep dive into common actions for the application, whereas Samsung's here is more about application control and placement. I do prefer Google's much more sophisticated implementation, but Samsung users will get on just fine too, looking to remove a shortcut or uninstall an app, for example. As is the current trend on Android, there is a built-in cleanup wizard in the guise of device maintenance here in settings. This gives a score for how clean a regular user's phone is, along with a big optimize now button. There's even an anti-malware scanner here. Plus, this is your way into fiddling with the three power saving presets off, mid and max, with each reducing screen resolution and applying increasingly drastic limits to the processor and running applications. Yes, I said screen resolutions. The full WQHD plus mode is frowned on by default with everything running in 1080p or FHD plus as it's known here. This saves around 25% on power and you really can't tell in terms of pixelation of the interface, even on the, the giant 6.2 inch display here. Why did Samsung put in the 1440p mode then? Well, for virtual reality use, no doubt, where even this high resolution is actually on the low side. The resolution switching is a fair compromise. And I have to be honest, even 720p on this lovely Samsung screen look well, pretty darn good. And the fewer pixels to throw around, the longer the battery will last. 1080p is a good default. The always on display is excellent on the S8 range, powered as it should be by an AMOLED screen. You get a choice of clock styles from digital to my favorite analog, from world clock to calendar and more, plus notification icons uh, showing what's come in since you last cleared things down. 
I've loved such glance displays since Nokia introduced them around a decade ago, and this is perhaps the best implementation yet. And with the time on screen all the time, there's not even a need to reach down to touch or press anything to get this information. The Galaxy S8 Plus is visually stunning, but fundamentally flawed, of course. The mass of fragile glass that needs protecting, the fixed used Bixby button, the awkward biometrics. However, it's going to be very influential going forwards and widely copied, I predict. Still, there's an insane amount of technology here and implemented so prettily. If you remember the very first Galaxy Note at a 5.3 inch screen diagonal and the phone was 83 millimeters wide. The S8 Plus has a significantly larger display in terms of area, yet it's only 73 millimeters wide and far more manageable in the hand as a result. With standout positives in the imaging, audio and charging departments, plus one of the best displays on any phone in history, the quirky S8 and the S8 Plus are still well worth a look. 